Thank you, Leanne, and thank you everyone for being patient uh, in these trying times. So I've been asked to talk about the project plans for photometric calibrations. Uh, put that in scare quotes for whatever reason, but uh, Slack is in scare quotes, of course, because I'm not at Slack. Um, I'm at home. So let's see, click. So what is photometric calibration? Well, ISR will convert ADU or DN, depending on what you prefer, to photons. And that's from Robert's talk yesterday. The background sky correction will discard the sky photons and leave the source photons. That was from Yusra's talk. And then the photometric calibration converts source photons to nanojansky for broadband filters, answering how bright is this object in physical units, uh, with Jansky being 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. And this is where Robert says, well, actually, um, we don't really get it quite on the Jansky scale, but I'm going to avoid that, as I say in my next slide. Um, so everything, we, everything is relative of what I'm going to be talking about. Measuring absolute fluxes is, is quite difficult. There was a space telescope uh, meeting on uh, this topic, uh, which was supposed to be happening right now, which was postponed to an undefined later date. Um, it's just that hard. Um, so most of our measurements are relative to something else. Currently uh, in DES, we use CalSpec spectrophotometric standards measured by HST. These are nice, they're above the atmosphere with a quality instrument, uh, but there are still issues at the percent level. And it depends on whether you believe the DA white dwarf models, precision spectrophotometry, all these other things. And absolute calibration is not the subject of this talk, which is what you would really need to get on a true Jansky scaling, but we can get on to something that is nano Jansky like, and that's kind of what we quote. So I want to define some terminology before I continue. Terminology as I, as I use it. Uh, uh, this isn't necessarily the phrasing that's used in the stack, um, which is a little bit in flux, but a filter is an optical element that selects a specific frequency or wavelength range. A filter plus the instrument plus the atmosphere defines a passband or band. A gray correction, I'll use that, and you would have heard uh, Gary talk about that as well, is an achromatic adjustment that affects all frequencies slash bands equally. We assume clouds are gray, but they are not spatially constant, of course. Dust accumulation on the mirrors and lenses is also probably gray. Um, but and a chromatic correction on the other hand depends on the object SED, the spectral energy distribution. And most everything depends on SED at some level. We approximate things as gray, but uh, uh, there, there is SED dependence. And then I also want to define uh, types of calibration errors, photometric calibration errors that we care about that, that goes directly into our science before I delve into the math. So we have the question of stability or repeatability. If you return to an object later, do you get the same calibrated top of the atmosphere flux? I'll define what that means in a moment. Um, uniformity. If you go to a different part of the survey and look at a star with the same SED and distance, do you get the same calibrated flux uh, or top of the atmosphere flux? So that's pointing at A and B and C to the same type of star. Do you get the same numbers? And then chromatic, if you compare stars of different colors, do you get a consistent ADU to flux transformation? So there's, there's kind of different types of errors, and we really want them all down at the uh, 5 millimag level for the project or 1 millimag uh, for desk. So the modeling chain that we have is uh, we have a star galaxy that's up there and you have some SED measurement. You either use CalSpec or Gaia spectrophotometry, or you have PhotoZ templates or stellar templates or however you do that. It goes through some layer of galactic dust, which you can calibrate with Gaia or I keep uh, far infrared observations, not near infrared or, or self calibration from the stars. We're not going to be talking about dust right now. 
but it is a, an issue and a problem. Then it goes through the atmosphere, which you can either calibrate with the auxiliary telescope, as Robert talked about yesterday, or self-calibration through the forward global calibration method that I'll be talking about today. Um, it goes through the telescope and the filter, and this we will, we will uh, uh, know quite well from the collimated beam projector, and then down to the CCD, which has its own uh, quantum efficiency as a function of wavelength, also uh, uh, tested with the collimated beam projector. So how do we compute calibrated flux? Well, the number of ADU detected by the CCD depends on the size of the telescope, the observed passband, and the spectral energy distribution, STD, of the source. We then have to integrate all the photons that hit the detector. And here is the integral, and I highlight here, um, we have the source SED, F nu of lambda, as I've written it, and the observed passband. This can be a, a function of position X and Y in the focal plane, altitude and azimuth, uh, compared to the sky, function of time, function of wavelength. Uh, this can change over all of these spatial, temporal, and, and wavelength scales. So there's some broadband uh, uh, that goes into the integral uh, that is not constant. But of course, um, for non-variable stars, the source SED is constant. So it's convenient to measure relative to the AB system. This is flat spectrum uh, defined uh, arbitrarily uh, with this 48.6. Um, and then we observe uh, top of the atmosphere magnitude relative to the AB system and this is, again, everything is relative by doing these integrals with um, uh, the F nu uh, of, our, of our source compared to this flat AB spectrum. Now, one of our goals is to convert an observed magnitude with a passband that varies with time and position to a standard magnitude so that the supernova and photo Z folks don't have to worry about all the unique passbands in the survey because it does vary with space and time and all of that. And in the Burke and Rykoff paper, uh, there's, there's more uh, 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 of the math, but the conversion from an observed magnitude to a standard magnitude uh, can be simplified to uh, a ratio of these integrals, these I naught integrals as we've defined them, which do not depend on um, uh, the SED of the source. So these are, these depend on uh, what the standard passband and the observed passband. And give me a moment and I'll define the standard passband. And then another chromatic term here that does depend on the SED of the source. Um, and if you go back, which I was supposed to do here on this one, uh, if you, uh, look at this integral and you see what happens if you have a flat spectrum source then um, this becomes one and one and so these two integrals these two terms cancel so for a flat spectrum source there is no chromatic term when you're talking about a b magnitudes and then also interestingly if the observed passband is equal to the standard passband then this uh, ratio uh, cancels and you end up with no uh, uh, chromatic term. So uh, you want to define your standard passband, whatever it is, as close to the most typical passband that you have. And the further passbands diverge, the greater the impact from different uh, source SEDs when you go from red to blue stars or different types of galaxies or supernovae uh, type 1a supernovae at different redshifts. And uh, particular challenges include CCD quantum efficiency for LSST CAM. Of course, we have E2V and ITL chips, which have different uh, uh, QEs, a function of wavelength, especially in the U and G bands. And then water vapor variations in the atmosphere, which affect the Z band and the Y band. And here is for DES, uh, histograms of, of what we've come out as our water vapor. Uh, the 
the vertical line here is the median, and then the, our standard we defined to be three millimeters, which is pretty close. And so you want to define this uh, uh, standard passband as close as possible, which minimizes any chromatic effects. And I'll talk about this tau uh, aerosol term in a moment. And so, yeah, choose as close to the typical observing conditions as possible. So what exactly does the atmosphere look like? Of course, the atmosphere is not clear. There's pesky molecules in there, which give us air to breathe and water to drink. So I guess the atmosphere is convenient, but um, uh, I'm jealous of those satellites uh, that sit above the atmosphere when we're talking about this. And here is a plot of a, the DES standard atmosphere, air mass 1.2, which is uh, 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 typical observing conditions. And uh, there's the different components. Uh, there's uh, oxygen line right here. Uh, there's ozone, which peaks into the R band, and then of course cuts off the edge of the U. Um, Rayleigh scattering from, from molecules in the atmosphere, uh, which depends on air mass. There's an aerosol term. Uh, this is you know, particles in the atmosphere, uh, which look a lot like the Rayleigh, uh, but have a slightly different uh, uh, wavelength dependence, but that can vary depending on whether uh, the particles are, for example, uh, dust coming from the east or salt coming from the west. Um, there's water vapor, of course, and the, mostly these water lines are in the, the Z and Y band, and then combined, this is a standard atmosphere. And you want this, again, to be as close to the typical conditions as possible. So what does this do to LSST? Well, here are the nominal LSST filters uh, with our nice uh, uh, little tilted uh, filter edges. And if you add um, uh, the pat the not just the filter, but the mirror, the lens, the CCD, and the atmosphere, this is what you get. Now notice the change in normalization here as I go. This is, you know, the filters have, you know, 90% uh, transmission. But once you add in the mirror, the lenses, CCDs, and atmosphere, we're down to about 45% uh, here in R and I. And of course the U band is is this little stub down here. So there's nothing we can do about avoiding uh, this, this, these fun shapes. But let's zoom in on the Z band, which is particularly uh, interesting to uh, cosmology and uh, to the imp impact of the atmosphere. So here's what the Z band looks like in LSST with no atmosphere. This is the instrument, so this is uh, uh, the mirror lenses and um, uh, CCD added in. And we add in a little bit of water and it drops down because of the, the standard atmosphere. And there's a little bit of the water lines here, but if we add in a lot of water, then we suddenly take a much bigger chunk out. And if I overlay these two, then you can see that what the water vapor does is primarily cuts the red end out of the Z band or the blue end out of the Y band. So this has a particular chromatic term because what it does is it affects uh, the, the stars and galaxies that have a red SED that peak in the red much more than stars and galaxies that, that, that peak in the blue. Now, you know, there is also a loss of throughput. And so that is the primary impact is you add more water vapor and you affect the transparency. And to predict the total throughput at the millimag level, we need to know the water vapor at the 0.2 millimeters of, of, of water uh, level. And this is a delta mag as a function of, of, of uh, precipital water vapor. But this is degenerate with any gray or opacity measurements, so knowing this is not critical. Much more important uh, to, that, that is not degenerate is the chromatic effect, because mostly the red end of the Z band is removed. The size of this depends on the SED. And so what I've plotted here is a change in the I minus Z color. It's easiest to see this in, in terms of the effect on color, which is what we also care about a lot in uh, photosies and supernova cosmologies. 
And for a standard water vapor measurement of three, of course, uh, when the observed passband is equal to standard passband, there is no chromatic term. So it does not matter whether you're looking at a red or blue star. And the uh, red lines here are just a range of stellar templates, what these look like. And the blue is a range of, of supernovae 1a at a range of redshift from like 0.1 to 1. And you can see if we need to know, uh, control the color at the one millimag level, then we need to know the water vapor at about the one millimeter level to get these chromatic corrections correct. Or else you're going to uh, have something to do with the atmosphere that is messing up how your supernovae look, for example, relative uh, from low to high redshift. And knowing how the supernovae work, comparing low to high redshift is the essential measurement of supernova cosmology. So how do we model the atmosphere? Well, Oxtel will observe stars around the sky with the low resolution Ronke grading from Robert's talk. Uh, so uh, you can remove the star, fit the atmosphere. And the goal again is to transform the atmosphere to the standard, not necessarily to know the individual component. Or you can do self calibration via the forward global calibration method, which is what I'm gonna be talking much more in detail about. So this is a way to solve the global calibration problem with a physical model of the atmosphere and the instrument, picking up on Stubbs and Tonry from way back, and of course, the Burke and Rykoff paper. In a nutshell, uh, any variation in the atmosphere has an observable, that has an observable effect has an observable effect. This is the key to self-calibration. For example, uh, the water vapor affects the, the Z band and Y band. And uh, if you have enough observations, repeated observations, then you can uh, regress over this and, and see how uh, uh, things are changing and, and isolate the effect of the water vapor. Of course, uh, the, you can't measure the water vapor when you're only observing in the G band, but you don't care about that because it doesn't have an observable, observable effect. And so given a set of atmospheric parameters at any given time under photometric conditions, uh, we can predict the atmosphere extinction as a function of wavelength. You also know, need to know the object SED, and Tingley's paper details uh, some of the effects of this in more detail. Once we know the atmosphere extinction, we can predict the fluxes of all the objects in an exposure. And uh, you do this for a bunch of repeated exposures. Now, I said that this works for photometric observations. And it's somewhat of a tautology, but I define this as those that are consistent with the atmosphere model that can be modeled uh, in this way. And for six years of DES, uh, this, in, this uh, encompasses about 80% of our observations. Uh, and the rest are, are just um, uh, tied on to that. And there's enough observations on any given night that, that we had the telescope open uh, that you can get, get a, maybe not great, but a constraint on the atmosphere. The advantage of FGCM is the forward model approach always leads to physically possible solutions. Uh, so physically motivated nonlinearities with air mass and no gray terms in the model means no runaway solution. Uses a full range of star colors. This increases the signal to noise, and this is useful information for constraining the atmosphere. It can incorporate instrumental transmission variations plus possible evolution of the pass bands. So I know Robert is worried about what if one of our filters is degrading over time. Well, uh, FGCM can, can take care of that. Um, it works best with more overlap in time than space, like any UberCal, and multiple bands per night is also very useful. The atmosphere model itself uses ModTran. Uh, this is not vitally important, um, but uh, it's convenient because ModTran will report all of the individual components of the atmosphere. And again, the goal is to get things to a standard, not necessarily delve into the atmospheric physics. We have water vapor, which varies quadratically through the night, aerosol optical depth, normalization and slope, it's just the power law, and ozone. And given the zenith distance and barometric pressure, we can compute O2 and Rayleigh scattering. 
So FGCM has been run on DS years one through three, so-called Y3, and DS years one through six, Y6. I have a paper I'm working on that's uh, perpetually behind. Uh, and FGCM has also been run on HSC PDR2 data uh, from the, the stack interface, and it's currently running right now on HSC S20A processing. So how well does it work? Well, for the first four years of DES, we had GPS measurements of water vapor. These were not used in the FGCM fit, uh, the, the one that I'm showing. And uh, details, you can find the papers, but you can look at the timing of the signal to various uh, GPS satellites to estimate the total water vapor. And so here's the water vapor from the GPS in millimeters, and here's the water vapor from the model. This is for Z-band exposures, where the signal is strongest, where we really care about it in DS. And there's a very nice correlation with some outliers, and a lot of these are actually problems with the GPS measurement. There's another way of measuring the water vapor. This is, I call the Lupton dream. Again, going back to this plot, you can see that uh, uh, different star colors respond in different ways uh, as a function of water vapor. And so uh, on a exposure by exposure basis, you can look at the relative shift in photometry of red and blue stars to estimate the amount of water vapor. And uh, I have this in the code. It is not actually used because of um, uh, various there's outliers that I worry about. And it has, I, you know, it's there as a diagnostic. Um, and here's again PWB from GPS. And here is the retrieved PWB taken um, uh, from each exposure with some sort of median smoothing uh, over time, but a Gaussian process as Gary alluded to, would probably be even better to, to, to show what's going on with the short time scale variations. And you can see that there is cons better consistency uh, than with the, with the model with the GPS, uh, which is pretty cool. But there are some outliers here. And these outliers uh, are, I think, a lot of these are, are problems with the GPS measurement. There's other temporal variations. Uh, in DES, we looked at six years of chromaticity residuals, compare red stars to blue stars per exposure. So this is the average residual of red stars to the average residual of blue stars. And every exposure in six years of DES has one point. And this is in the G-band. And you can see the steady chromatic term from year to year. And then we recoded the mirror and it drops back down. So this is molecular degradation of the mirror surface. No amount of washing will clean this off. Um, and so this goes in as a smooth component in the model, uh, uh, which, which helps the, the G-band uh, uh, chromatic term. Uh, for hypersupreme cam, uh, here's another example of uh, uh, another effect that can happen. Uh, this is... Uh, a comparison to uh, pan stars one magnitudes, which are used as a constraint in the fit, but uh, not actually uh, for this part of the model. Uh, and uh, this is the reference magnitude from pan stars one minus the raw observed magnitude of the stars uh, as a function of, of day. And each uh, average for each exposure goes in, or no, this is each star goes in. And you can see this it degrades by 50% over these several years before it's recoded. And there's this period of, of steeper decline that's seen in all the bands. And this corresponds with increased activity in Kilauea, perhaps the impact of volcanic fog or VOG. So something that Gary talked about was uh, FGC was a uh, measurement of star flats. This is uh, the normalization of the response of the instrument to focused light relative to what the dome flat says. And FGC, what, in DES, we did the star flats based on dithered uh, dense star field observations. Um, HSC, we don't have those, uh, but you can be generated from plenty of dithered wide field observations. And so 
Uh, here's just what it looks like for the I2 and the Z band, and this is part of the FGCM model. And you can see this is in millimags. Uh, it's actually a, you know, this is 4.8% uh, and 5.2% negative. So even after taking about uh, the effect of the pixel area variation, uh, there's a 10% um, uh, star flat term uh, in the I and Z bands. Um, we can also test uh, throughput measurements. And so this is a, a map per CCD in DES. Uh, the, what each CCD shows is the chromatic difference between red and blue stars averaged over uh, the whole survey. And uh, this is in millimags. So some of these CCDs, uh, this is the model, which we get from scans of, of the instrument. And the red ones have a 1.5% chromatic term in one direction if, if, if predicted. Uh, this is between red and blue stars. And the bluest ones, actually a 2.4% between reddest and bluest stars. This is what we measure in the middle from the stars. And here's the residual. Now I've shifted, the scale is the same, but it's now been centered around zero. And what is the source of these red and blue? This is uh, varying QE, typically AR coding in the G band. And so here is a picture of uh, the, the DCAM focal plane and uh, uh, the pattern uh, if you look carefully, is is very similar to what the light and blue dark look like, and we're what we're light and light and dark blue, and what we're going to find in LSST, of course, is uh, a big difference between the ITL and each of these CCDs. We can do the same thing in HSC. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have individual CCD QE measurements, and so here's what the model from uh, HSC looks like which is only due to the filter scan. Here's measured from the stars and the residual. And again, this is the same sort of thing uh, that we have uh, a couple percent effect, uh, but this is not modeled at the moment properly because we don't have the scans, but the CBP will give that to us uh, in DES, in, D in LSST. In the R2 filter, it's also interesting. Here's the prediction uh, from the filter scans, but this has been uh, azimuthally averaged. Measured from stars, you can see in the residual that there's an azimuthal turn, term. And if you look at the filter scans in detail, then indeed there is an azimuthal dependence of the red end of the R2 filter in HSC that leads to a kind of a, a half percent uh, to one percent uh, chromatic term. And this, the stack does not support yet the azimuthal dependence. That will have to be updated. Uh, the repeatability in DES six years uh, gets down to two to four millimags repeatability for most bands and colors. The worst is the uh, reddest stars in G band, which are the toughest. Um, uh, so this is, this is good performance. And of course, Gary already showed my punchline uh, earlier today, comparing DESY6 to Gaia G band. This is a weighted combination of GRIZ, which overlaps Gaia G band. And we have uniformity at kind of the two millimag level with something mysterious going on here at the West End. But all of these structure, everything that you see here is um, uh, traces the Gaia scan pattern. So these are not, uh, not introduced by the FGCM calibration. In HSC PDR2, uh, without reference stars, we still get three millimag uniformity with these wildly separated fields. Thankfully, LSST is not going to observe uh, with an observing strategy like this, which will make it a lot easier to tie everything together. Now I have one more topic, uh, which is uh, uh, getting back to, wait, what are we calibrating? And um, traditionally we use a largish aperture for calibrations. Uh, using uh, this is correct for fluence images, 
number of photons incident on the pixel versus surface brightness images. Uh, and these differ by a factor of pixel area. Um, but not all flux from the stars falls into this aperture. What are the implications and how do we correct for this? Aperture corrections. Unfortunately, this is not a uniquely defined concept. There's many uh, uses of the term aperture correction. So I'm going to call these aperture corrections of the first, second, and third kind. Aperture corrections of the first kind, um, well, our best stellar and galaxy photometry is based on PSF convolved fluxes. The PSF extends to infinity. Uh, here's a plot of what uh, looks like in DES, uh, the PSF wings. And this was uh, uh, from a paper on uh, intracluster light. So one question is, should we correct our aperture fluxes to infinity? Use a curve of growth and go all the way out because that is what we want to know, the total amount of flux. But this is very difficult and very noisy. And, it, and how does it vary on short spatial and temporal scales? This is, this is, you know, it's a ton of data to actually get this out to large scale. And how it varies uh, is, is, is tougher. So aperture corrections of the second kind, as I call them, uh, all our measurements are relative. If we measure our primary calibration stars, e.g. CalSpec, with the same uh, aperture, we only need to know the flux within this aperture. So we're, we're, everything is relative all the way up, and we're putting everything on the same scale. So we're trusting that somewhere up there, there will be a total correction. So what we do is we compute an aperture correction map to convert our PSF or C model or whatever type of model fluxes to the same normalization as our calibration fluxes, fluxes for well-measured stars. That's our 12 pixel aperture. This accomplishes the same goal as the curve of growth, but avoids the pesky infinities. Um, and what I want to highlight is that these aperture correction maps are applied to all stack coad quantities that rely on PSF models. So if we mess these up, then it actually, the, the, this feeds on to, to messing up the photometry and all the coad. But we would never do that, would we? Well, uh, here is just a plot of, of a comparison of PSF magnitude, uncorrected, so without aperture correction, uh, uh, minus our reference calibration aperture. And this is for uh, 100 CCDs in a field. So this is summarizes one, one visit. Uh, and so uh, without the aperture correction, uh, you actually get an offset at the bright end because of no different normalization. This is what we want to compute, what's going on uh, uh, with the amount of lost flux but we want it just relative to our reference flux. But we also have this curvature. And this is because of sky background issues that user was showing on single uh, CalEx, single visits. And so uh, what we were doing before, uh, we must be careful how we compute the aperture correction map. Uh, originally, uh, not too long ago, we were using all PSF stars, which is what's plotted here. And because of the sky background issue, the five per minutes. CCD. Hmm? Eli, five minute warning, sorry. Okay, great, perfect. Uh, the per CCD correction, uh, you not only is there a bunch of noise that's added, but it actually does not end up intersecting with zero. And the reason it doesn't is because the aperture correction was computed for all these stars and not just the bright ones. And so, uh, you're summing, uh, putting into the weight uh, stars that are curved, and so it ends up doing an overcorrection. If you only use the bright stars to do the aperture correction, then you reduce the scatter and end up uh, intersecting with zero. So this is a, a, a quick and dirty thing to do, uh, which we've implemented in the stack. But uh, is this method optimal? The answer is no, I don't think so. Um, I believe we know more about the PSF variations, as imperfect as this knowledge is, uh, than to rely on fully empirical correct, uh, corrections. So we plan on exploring this further, and if anyone has ideas for how to improve this, uh, I'm certainly all ears. Now, the, 
And my last thing is the aperture corrections of a third kind. And this uh, was what Gary was talking about and led to some confusion. So uh, this is, as the wings of the PSF change, then more light will go in and out of this aperture. This is around right here. And so this wing, not just the core, but if the wing changes, then uh, light scatters in and out. And this is what Gary was talking about this morning. And the FGCM model also must account for this. And so the way we do this is computing the median of the magnitude, delta magnitude in a larger and this aperture. And so what this is saying, going back here, is we're essentially computing the derivative of the slope. And the amount of flux that is falling out of the aperture is proportional to this derivative, which makes sense. And this is for HSC, what this looks like um, in the G and Z bands. And you can see uh, that uh, this is the uh, gray, uh, the total exposure visit average gray residual um, as a function of this, as I call X seeing variable, this delta, median delta magnitude. It's actually a couple percent. This is the primary source of apparent non photometricity on, on short temporal scales. And um, uh, on, on uh, these spatial scales as well. And this is from Gary's paper. In summary, we find that all of the deviations above one millimag RMS, uh, beyond what you would expect from the air mass, is variations in the aperture correction. And so uh, this, is, this is the big conclusion that it's not, it does not seem to be transparency variations, but instead, uh, it, it, it really does seem to be uh, the, the PSF changing and going into and out of our metric aperture. And if you don't take this into account, then not only do you get biases as a function of position, depending on the, the large uh, uh, size seeing, the wings of the PSF, but you also reject a lot of otherwise good exposures as being non-photometric. Um, this, uh, like 30% of the exposures uh, would be rejected as non-photometric by our criteria if we did not put this into the model. And so these really are clear nights that you can model the atmosphere very well. And if you just do the simple PSF modeling, then you can, you can account for that as well. And so, uh, uh, you know, in conclusion, um, we need to know the instrumental throughput, the atmosphere, and the throughput variations. In DES, we're getting down to below five millimag in all of these types of errors without external reference catalog. This will be easier with more overlap in space and time, uh, which is part of the LSST acronym. And so, but aperture corrections and the PSF modeling remain issues. So thank you. Thank you, Eli, for that excellent talk. Do we have any questions? First of all, a round of applause on Slack for Eli. Uh, do we have any questions? I don't see any hands up at the moment. Ah, Colin's hand is up, just a minute. So, so just to round out my question from earlier, I guess this really was a misunderstanding. And so as I get it now, the correction that Gary was talking about for this kind of six to eight arc second thing really is doing the same job as the LSST corrections of the second kind. Is that correct? No, it's it's not. It's this third kind. That's what Gary's talking about. Right, right, right. But those are the, the they're trying to do the same job. They actually don't, um, as far as I know, because this is the derivative. While the the aperture corrections of the second kind is trying to put the PSF model on the same footing at, in the simplest sense, the PSF model, uh, at, on the same footing as the uh, uh, metric aperture. So it, it, this is actually something to do with how do you measure and normalize your PSF? So, so well, I, what I'm I... talking about here is, is, is in a forward model sense, you know, if you did a traditional thing and you took a, a reference catalog uh, 
this is totally degenerate with a gray correction. If you had an infinitely dense, rigid uh, uh, reference catalog, then you you wouldn't necessarily need this, and you wouldn't um, uh, even even look for it. Does that make but, sense? But I guess what I'm saying is that they're both trying to do something about the variable level of winginess of PSFs. So I, I mean, they they I mean they're they're related. I mean they're both aperture okay. corrections of a sort. Um, but uh, they, uh, they, you know, one of them is trying in a, in a forward model sense, and again, looking at the derivative of it, uh, to estimate how much light is falling out of your specific aperture, while this one is an integral quantity that is approximating, you know, for the PSF, how far integrating the PSF to that radius. Okay, thanks. How much you miss by doing that integral. Maybe that's a little bit clearer. I see another question on Slack. Uh, Michael? I don't know. Someone has to unmute him. I think Conrad is up and unmuted. Ah, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Can you hear me? Yes. So the, my question was, what would be the physics that explains these, this winginess of the PSF? And is there any way, any parameter you can measure that would help you to, to predict this? The physics of what part? Like, what does the PSF... Uh, you mean in, in terms of the atmosphere model? Like right. in terms of like the turbulence of it? I, 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 like I actually yeah. don't know what goes into the, the, the wings of the PSF at those radius. I should know, but. But, it, but it's not correlating to pressure, to, to water pressure or to aerosols or anything. It like does this. not it's seem to correlate with, with the water vapor or the aerosols or anything else. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's 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 turbulence kind of stuff, I think. It's the the scale, what uh, you know, Robert Robert can explain it better than me. Okay, thanks. The outer scale. I didn't have a question. I was just answering the question. I can ask a question. <laughs> I have to think of one. <laughs> Uh, Moose, what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> I, d I didn't eat. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's sad. Eli, what do you do for aperture correction calibrations in crowded fields? Ah, um, so uh, I have not looked in very, very, very crowded fields. Um, but again, uh, from everything that I've seen, even into the, you know, LMC-ish range uh, that we have in um, uh, DS, uh, which I can go back, you know, down here is where we, this, this is much too dense for what, um, uh, for, for what we do for DS cosmology. It's much too dense for what we want for desk cosmology. It is not too dense for what um, uh, you know, you know, what we're going to have for for the LSST survey in terms of um, uh, you know galactic plane uh, stuff. So I have not looked at that, but for everything that I've seen, the 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 median of these, you know, brighter, you know, I'm taking brighter stars and looking at these the median delta between these two radii has worked well, but I haven't tested it down to, you know, extreme crowded field photometry. Okay, um, that's all we have time for in terms of questions. I don't think there are any more anyway. Thank you again, Eli, for that uh, really nice talk. We will now switch over to Jim Bosch, who's going to talk about project plans for astrometric calibration.